Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Please note that this episode of the ADHD Experts Podcast is best experienced while viewing the presenter's slide. The slides are available for free download at attitudemag.com by searching for Podcast 366. That's Podcast 366. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts broadcast. We are pleased to have Renee Hamilton Newman here to talk with us about how to identify and manage dyscalculia in students with ADHD. Before we get started, let me note a couple of housekeeping items. Those of you tuned in to the live webinar may download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you receive around an hour after the live broadcast. For those of you listening in replay or podcast mode, you can visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 366 to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater understanding of ADHD. And the sponsor of this week's Attitude webinar is Brain Balance. Brain Balance is a holistic cognitive development program designed to help kids and teens with learning disorders, anxiety, ADHD, and beyond improve focus, attention, and behavior. Brain Balance creates a customized plan based on your child's needs to support their social, emotional, and academic growth. An exploratory study with Harvard's McLean Hospital found the Brain Balance program to be as effective as low-dose stimulant medication in alleviating, alleviating excuse me, ADHD symptoms in children. Visit brainbalance.com to learn about more about brain balance today. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. Now for today's topic, dyscalculia is a learning disability that makes it difficult to do math and tasks that involve math. It often leads to math anxiety in students and even adults. It is not understood as well as dyslexia but some experts believe dyscalculia is just as common. Children with ADHD symptoms are at higher risk for math difficulties compared to their neurotypical peers. They may not understand quantities or concepts like biggest versus smallest or effectively af apply principles to solve math problems. Students with dyscalculia are often lost in the math classroom. They may be hopping ahead of their peers in reading and writing, but dread being embarrassed in math class. This webinar explains why even good math instruction doesn't stick for the dyscalculic learner and how to optimally engage at at-risk students and achieve deep understanding of math concepts. Expert Renee Hamilton Newman will give us insights, perspective, and strategies to manage it. Renee is founder and president of dyscalculia.org, a global nonprofit providing information, support, diagnostics, and training to optimize outcomes for those with significant learning difficulties with math, reading, and writing. Renee has a master's degree in instructional design and special education. She has a specialist certificate in distance education from the University of Wisconsin and certificates in LD diagnosis, dyslexia, remedial reading, writing, mathematics, and data privacy and security. You can ask questions of Renee during her presentation, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can after she is done. So with all that being said, I'll turn it over to Renee. Thanks so much for being here today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I'm Renee Newman, and I'm going to speak to you about some of my personal experiences because I have dyscalculia. I'm married to a dyslexic, and uh, I have four kids, and um, they all had some degree of some sort of learning disability, and they're all engineers or studying to be engineers. So um, 
the impossible is possible if you know how to approach it. And I'm going to talk to you about a lot of those things. Um, and so um, we're going to talk about how anxiety, um, math anxiety or anxiety in general is triggered by something. And then it's, it's a natural consequence of our environment. And it's very real. And it does have, um, it does have chemical, uh, a chemical reality and, and an emotional one. And it's often triggered by our history also. And we're going to talk about dyscalculia, what that is as a syndrome or a collection of problems. Um, And we're going to talk about how cognitive load or like our capacity to um, handle simultaneous demands um, factors into it. And working memory, which is like our mental counter space that we have to work with. Um, Visual memory, auditory memory, which our memory for what we hear. And sequencing, their sequential memory. And then when you combine a bunch of things like visual, spatial, directional, sequential processing, that can overwhelm us too. And and then lastly, we'll talk about solutions. What to do about all these challenges. So uh, anxiety, again, is a natural consequence. When you're unable to perform as needed or expected, Um, And then you combine that with your past experiences of not being able to meet demands or meet expectations. And when you get into any situation, of course, your brain is always predicting. It's always making predictions about how things are going to turn out. And if if you predict that you're not going to be successful or meet expectations, yes, you will experience anxiety. And um, you will naturally avoid what's unpleasant and what makes you feel inadequate. So whenever you have instructional or situational disconnect, you're in a classroom or someone's giving you directions on how to get to the nearest gas station because you've run out of gas and you are not visualizing the directions that they're giving you and you are disconnected, you feel lost you experience stress, you struggle to reconnect. And if you're unsuccessful, you experience frustration and maybe anger and distress. These are all natural things. Um, So let's imagine you have difficulty reading clocks. This is a common problem with adults and children with learning difficulties, okay? You need to know what time it is. Okay, you're under pressure. You need to know what time it is because you need to take action based on what that clock says. And you look at that clock, but you're not really sure how to read it. I mean, you've learned how to tell time, but when you look at the clock, something happens. It's a visual, spatial, directional, sequential task. And looking at that clock, you have what we call demand uncertainty. You, the demand is you must read the clock. You're uncertain how to read the clock and you're under time pressure and all of this results in you just becoming stressed out. You're distressed. And once you're distressed, your processing capacity, your ability to even reason about it becomes diminished. So math anxiety is a real thing. It has real consequences in the brain. It does activate and shrink the brain areas that are responsible for fear and threats and pain. And it reduces activity in your processing and reasoning areas. Uh, Cortisol, stress chemicals are are released. And this further overloads and disrupts your working memory. Your, that, I I, I call it bandwidth, your mental bandwidth, uh, your processing ability. So to reduce the mix, to reduce math anxiety, uh, some people have tried different things, like before taking a math test, write about your feelings, make positive affirmative statements, like I can do math, I am good at math, um, adopt a positive mindset. This can help, okay? It has been proven to help. Um, but on a deeper level, you want to provide uh, resources to experience abstract concepts and you want to deeply understand every concept and every word before you even get to the math demand. Um, you want to be able to see relationships 
and uh, you want tools to facilitate calculation. I'm going to show you some examples of why calculation is so difficult. And you want to achieve math language fluency, which means you need to know if, if I say one third, you need to understand that as a fraction, as words, when you see it, you know, as with a bar, with a numerator and denominator, um, as a percentage, you need to understand multiple ways of, of seeing this idea expressed. That's fluency. Um, a lot of people think of fluency as just, oh, you know, how fast can I say my rattle off my multiplication tables? Well, that is what we call being fluent if you can know your addition and multiplication facts. Um, that's also called fluency. But what I'm talking about when I say fluency is knowing many ways to understand ideas, many ways to say ideas, write ideas, and understand them when you hear them or see them. That's math language fluency. And remember, we are always, there. you cannot do anything from the day you're born without thinking quantitatively. You're worried about you're hungry. That's a deficit. You know, you need to eat. You're in the negative when you're hungry. And then when you eat, you're, you're experiencing a positive. So you, your bottle is half empty. You are doing math from the day you're born. We just don't really realize it. So I always like to tell my students that because they always claim they can't do it. And I say, you've been doing it all along. You can do it. We're just going to put words to it. So what we want to do is generate a bunch of positive experiences where we are confident in our ability because we have done it successfully and we have learned strategies for doing math when historically it's been a disaster for us. And um, we have new tools for doing the math to take care of all of our weaknesses. We will use tools in place of our weaknesses. Now, I don't know if I... I did mention before that I have dyscalculus. So I know that it is a syndrome. It is a combination of little things, little irritating uh, inadequacies that compound all day long to just frustrate you and make your life difficult. For instance, uh, dyscalculus is persistent difficulties with time, keeping track of time, reading clocks. Uh, keeping track of calendars, interpreting what you see on the calendar, um, schedules, dates. I mean, we can't get away from any of these things. Number sequences, uh, directions, north, south, west, east, left and right. Um, visual spatial processing, for instance. I'll give you an example of this. Um, for instance, I'm not so impaired that, that I can't do anything. But when I'm watching my daughter's soccer game, the action that happens on the field is often too fast for my brain to, to uh, process effectively. For instance, someone will be down on the ground and I'll say, what just happened? Because it happened quicker than my brain could keep track of what was happening. So, uh, and everybody's different. Not everybody's going to be just like me or just like anybody else you see. Um, every every person's going to present with their own set of uh, characteristics and difficulties and strengths and weaknesses, you know. So anytime you educate anyone, regardless of age, you have to take into consideration the whole person, what they're good at and what they're bad at, and you have to mitigate the weak areas and try to develop them, and you have to um, really teach through their strengths and gain confidence that way. Um, procedural memory is an issue. So you may have difficulty. I know I had difficulty learning to tie my shoes, learning to ride a bike. And once I got these things, it was okay, but it took a while. So you might see children who have delays in these areas. Uh, that's procedural memory uh, or motor sequencing, tying your shoes, learning dance steps, playing sports. Um, you might see a lot of careless errors, what we call careless errors. Uh, they're not actually careless errors. The child does care to be accurate, but their brain is pretty glitchy. So they might make a lot of errors, misspeaking and 
and writing things or forgetting to add. Um, and they will struggle to keep up in the classroom or to engage, whether it's a dance class or a math class. Um, it's kind of a universal thing. All right, I'm going to show you some examples now of dyscalculia in real life. And these are examples, these are samples um, from a testing situation. So this first example is a 29-year-old professional counselor who came to me because he's having difficulty. He's gotten written up at work for um, taking too long to tabulate data. So he has to give his uh, clients these surveys and then um, he has to tabulate the data and depending on the survey, it tells him whether they get admitted to a program or, or what. So, um, so here, this man cannot keep the idea of a number in his mind. Now, this is an extreme case of dyscalculia, all right? So what he does is he makes tally marks. So he made a tally mark for four. But then by the time he got done with that, his working memory was overwhelmed. His processor hit its capacity. And what he did was a common mistake called perseveration. His brain got stuck on the three, which was like the last thing he saw there. And he just wrote three for the answer. He totally forgot to subtract. And we see this kind of thing all the time. We'll, teachers will call that, oh, that's a careless error. You weren't paying attention. But this is not a matter of paying attention. This man had excellent attention. This is his overall cognitive profile. So his performance profile. So he scored very well in reading, writing, spelling, listening comprehension. You know, everything is above average or, or average, but you see the red bars are deficient in math. Okay, here is another example from this man. Now, when this man came to me, when he started doing his math this way, making these tally marks, I thought this guy is trying to, uh, he's, he's, he's trying to fake it. He's trying too hard to fake it. You know, that he, he somehow wants me to write up some paper saying he has dyscalculia and he's really trying hard to fake it. And then I realized, oh no, he's not faking it. He was perspiring and his face was beat red. He was embarrassed and he was distressed. This took a lot of mental energy to draw 37 tally marks and then 61 tally marks, okay? And then to count them over and over and to conclude, all right, I counted over and over and I got 98 and he wrote 98. So he did it, did it correctly. It took him a long time. But notice, he has no attention problem, he, and he has no uh, deficit in persisting, okay? Um, here, again, you see him drawing tally marks, 48 tally marks, which was correct. He drew 25 tally marks, but then working memory was overwhelmed. He forgot to subtract, and he added, because that's what he's doing. He's counting. So what is counting? Counting's added, adding. So he just added. He did this again on this next one, 14 minus eight. He drew the tally marks, he added them. And then same thing with five times two. He drew five tally marks and two tally marks. But instead of drawing five tally marks twice, which is multiplication, he just added them and concluded the answer was seven. Okay, and this is a man with a normal IQ. So he's very impaired in math, but he's very uh, capable in every other area. This is an 18 year old high schooler with severe math anxiety. So when it came to the untimed math portions of the test, she did just fine. And she, but when she got to long division, all right, she, she put 17, she had no, um, no awareness of like where the answer should go as far as place value goes. So a lack of place value awareness. And then in the second example, She's mixing up operations. She's not, she's not completing the task at hand. So, but she did fine on the easy stuff, your basic addition and subtraction uh, and multiplication problems. And she's very talented at dance and um, 
drawing and, and writing and um, playing music. So um, that's atypical because usually uh, kids with severe dyscalculia have, they have um, you know, they have that muscle sequencing thing going on. But um, so this gal, she had been to private boarding schools her whole life and she was publicly humiliated in math class for not being able to keep up. And it's that public humiliation that she experienced that triggered the panic attack and the anxiety attacks that she had when it comes to doing math under timed conditions. So when she wasn't being timed and no one was, you know, judging her, she was able to do quite well. But once time became a factor and it, it mattered how fast she worked and how accurate she was, she worked herself up into an anxiety attack, a panic attack. And she was actually hyperventilating when it came to the uh, timed portion. Like in school, we have the mad minute. You have a minute to do all these addition or subtraction or multiplication problems. Um, when it came to that math fluency portion of this test, she went into a full-blown anxiety attack, screaming, hyperventilating, uh, hiding under the desk. And this is an 18-year-old girl who in, in almost every other way is perfectly normal. Okay, so it, it stands to reason that when a person, regardless of age, is prone to this type, this level of anxiety or, or even mild anxiety, what our job is as educators and parents is to prevent that trigger. You want to work them, exercise them, to the point of, of capacity and maybe try to exceed it a little bit, but you don't want to do it in such a way that you're going to trigger that anxiety because once we trigger anxiety, nothing is going to be accomplished afterwards. You're done for. So we want to avoid that at all costs. Here's a 15 year old girl who does the multiplication, but she just has no awareness of the decimal point. Okay, above average IQ, talented writer and illustrator, but poor procedural memory. And we see this a lot, procedural memory. So if you're taught without deep understanding of what you're doing and you're relying on your procedural memory and your procedural memory is bad, it's inconsistent, um, then learning procedures isn't an effective strategy for doing math for you. You need to understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, why it makes sense that you do it that way in order to do it successfully. So what is math anxiety? Um, or what is dyscalculia? It's called a lot of things. And I just want to quickly give you some words. Some people call it math dyslexia, uh, math anxiety, math learning disorder, MLD, um, specific learning disability in mathematics, reasoning and calculation. You'll see that in, in the school system. Um, I'll call it SLD, um, developmental dyscalculia or Gerstmann syndrome. So there's a number of blindness. There's, there's a lot of different terms. And uh, if you go through time, the study of uh, math learning disability, you'll see an evolution of terms just like in any other uh, disability area. So dyscalculia is normal or above average intelligence plus these characteristics. Now, not all of them are going to be seen in every person. Um, the person may lose track when they're counting. They may use their fingers or tally marks to keep track when they're counting. Why? Because they can't hold the number in mind. Um, they may draw pictures to reason. Again, anytime you're writing something down or using your fingers, this is auxiliary memory. Why do you need it? because you can't keep it up here. Now, I am this person. I talk out loud. I reason aloud to keep track. If I don't do that, I can't keep track. Um, normal or above average intelligence plus faulty memory of math facts and procedures. You might know them one day and forget them the next. You may be able to follow patterns quite easily, but then when it comes to the next day to do it or the next week, you're frustrated because you're like, I know I just did this for three hours yesterday. And it's like, I, I honestly, I don't remember how to do this now. So that's frustrating. Um, and an insufficient working memory for math. Like 
the inability to be able to do all the things at once required of a task. Um, you may have unconscious number and symbol errors in speech. So you might misspeak uh, when reading, when reasoning. So you may see it, you may say it or read it correctly, but in your head, your brain's acting on different information than what you just spoke and read. Um, and then in writing, you may write something different than you intend. Now, People with dyscalculia will usually depend on primitive strategies like fingers, counting, adding, subtracting, but like repeated addition to do multiplication or repeated subtraction to do division. Um, dyscalculia is not poor math performance due to inattention, illness, insufficient interest or motivation, anxiety, education gaps, poor instruction, or study skills, poverty, or any other sort of environmental factor. Okay, so I personally and a lot of other people have difficulty visualizing numbers, shapes, uh, changes in orientation, layouts, and objects in three dimension. Now, dyslexics, on the other hand, are usually gifted in this area. Okay, so this inability to visualize is a big problem. Now, here's an example of a careless error, okay? What a teacher would call a careless error. This kid came up with one A, which is correct, but he put an extra number in there. So you'll see these random number uh, additions, you know, insertions. Um, here, now notice this. I want you to pay attention to this. See the three and the one? This 12-year-old boy, See, sees that it's multiplication, okay? But when he sees the three and the one, his brain immediately predicts, I'm supposed to add this. So he adds three and one is four. And he puts down the sum, four. And then he takes the four and four times two is eight. But then he goes back to what's really there. Three times three is nine. Okay, so these are the types of errors that if you're not paying attention as a teacher or as a parent, and you're just saying, that's wrong. What's wrong with you? That's wrong. You need to kind of analyze what's happening here. Here, this is a perseveration error. So the this same 12-year-old boy um, got stuck on uh, six times eight is 48. He, he got that right. And then five times Five times eight is 40. So he went to write 40, but his brain got stuck on the six in the denominator and he wrote 46 instead. So we would call that a, a careless error, but that's just a brain glitch and a typical one at that. So that's perseveration, the brain getting stuck on inappropriate uh, stimuli. All right, so... These are easy to mix up, okay? This has to do with auditory working memory. 12 and 20 sound similar. They both start with 12. 14 and 40 sound very similar. 16 and 60, 18 and 80, you get the idea. So if you know a, a child is glitchy, you're going to observe probably these types of errors and you're going to train the child to be very vigilant when it comes to these types of mix-ups because they will occur. Okay, again, sound perseveration. Here's an example. Instead of writing 12, he wrote 20 for the numerator because it sounds similar. Directional confusion, we talked about that. Your, your sense of direction. So you can teach a person to have a sense of direction if it's not innate. Um, it takes work, but it can be learned. Um, flipping numbers. So this, this person uh, kind of uh, multiplied backwards. So they flipped the two and the five or did it out of order. That's directional ambiguity. So if you don't have a good sense of direction and you're trying to do math, you're, you get 
visually overwhelmed by all the directions you have to go and you have to go north and you have to go south and then you have to go uh, northwest and then you have to go so you have to go around in circles you know? <laughs> and that overwhelms your visual spatial processor and makes arithmetic very difficult um here this student is a 25 year old college student what she do the five and the two look almost similar so she substituted the um, five for the two, but she did the rest of it correctly. But that's a substitution of a very similarly shaped number just flipped. Um, so when you get to this point of your life where you have to uh, manage your finances and figure change due, calculate tips and taxes and discounts, this is going to be very challenging, especially if you are mixing up operations adding to your checkbook instead of subtracting or um, mixing your numbers up instead of um, uh, 321, uh, you're thinking you have 432. <laughs> so um, you have to learn to be really vigilant. Um, and then mixed up operations. That's a working memory problem. So consumed with uh, what to do that you forgot what to do, even though it says add this is biggest day there. Okay, um, may, you may know what to do, but then this person drew arrows to indicate direction, which she, she knew the direction, but she just forgot to do the multiplication. Um, so you'll see uh, grownups and students who have difficulty um, keeping track of uh, how to keep score during games or the rules for games, and, and they just may avoid playing type, certain types of games that require that level of um, cognitive engagement, you know, okay. Um, here, the student repeatedly subtracted to do long division. Again, this is a 25-year-old college student. She doesn't know how to do 108 divided by two. So what does she do? She takes 108, she, re she subtracts two, and then she does it over and over and over and counts up how many times she did it to get to zero. Again, um, Telling time on the clock is difficult, but also keeping track of time. Um, I'll let you go to the website and um, go through the research. Um, but there's actually a brain area, like a brain specialty area, that uh, has less uh, brain tissue in it. And it is not activated. It's not lighting up when it's supposed to be lit up um, during math functions. So they know that there is a real brain basis for dyscalculia. All right, so I'll let you read more about that. For instance, um, this, people with dyscalculia, they can't tell you how many dots. They will count them and they don't. They lack strategies for what they call subitizing, um, the ability to know how many dots are there without counting. Um, there's a lot, and these are dyslexia research centers. Um, this is Europe and this is the United States. A lot of universities do dyscalculia research. Now we'll talk about solutions real quick. Um, so there's something called universal design for learning, which basically in a nutshell means we want to bake in instructional redundancies, um, or sorry, informational redundancies into our instruction. We want to have the information in an auditory form so you can hear it, in a visual form so you can see it. We want to experience it through activities. Uh, we want to the student to be able to demonstrate it and explain it themselves and have several opportunities for them to demonstrate mastery. Um, whether it's writing a paper or making a website or doing a presentation or constructing something like a model, um, we want to give them choices so that they can show their more, so they can demonstrate mastery in several ways. Math is a foreign language. It should be taught as such. Okay, it's the language of the universe. And Galileo said it's God's language. It's the language that he used. And it's the language of, of shapes. And if you don't understand this, you cannot understand even one word of, of the language of, of quantity. Um, so math is universal in that no matter where you go in the world, you're going to use 
the same language, the same symbols. And that's what makes it universal, this language of mathematics. So we want to focus on, because it's a foreign language, we want to teach the words first, because we learn uh, oral language first, the the words, the vocabulary, um, the grammar, kind of the whole system, how it works, how it's constructed, uh, the syntax, the rules, the conventions, how you write it, um, patterns and shapes and facts and forces and the interpretation and translation, how you interpret what you see and then how you translate that into symbolic form or even word form. Um, All these are part of language, parts of language acquisition. And uh, once you have acquired kind of all of those facets of language learning, you have achieved fluency. You're able to express things in multiple ways. And that's where we want to get. Now, because I have dyscalculia and I'm a teacher um, and a therapist, I had to create tools to make this information stand still for, for students, for myself and for students. So I created this decimal place value chart and this way to visualize your head is the decimal point, which will help you orient to the number. And this has all the math language information and you see these letters on the bottom These are your international symbols. For instance, M stands for mega, which is our international prefix. That means million. Okay. And state K stands for kilo, which means thousand. And so just knowing these things and being able to see it all in front of you in an aerial view is super, super helpful for people who have an inability to visualize this in their head and an inability to sequence this consistently the different periods of the place value chart. Um, And we're just teaching them procedures in school and it's really a disaster because they can't retain them from one, uh, you know, one lesson to the next or from one year to the next. So always uh, here's a way to learn fractions uh, visually. And you'll notice that, see these like two sets of five dimes, everything is in sets of dimes or I'm sorry, sets of five like we see on dice, four corners, one in the middle, because our brains are able to handle that much visual information simultaneously. And beyond that, it's getting to be a stretch. Okay, so in summary, strategies, um, when you're in the school situation, you want to mask or reduce the visual stimuli. You want to isolate digits. You want to, students just only see one problem at a time. If you're giving them a page full of problems, because if you don't, they will see all those problems. They've become visually overwhelmed. Once you're overwhelmed and distressed, no uh, no efficient uh, processing is going on. Okay. Um, you want to substitute authentic or constructive assessments. Let them build a model of how something works or teach a lesson on how to solve this problem instead of taking a test on it. Much more effective. Um, you want to allow them to reason verbally, reason out loud, talk out loud about what they're doing and why they're doing it. Color code. They need to color code, group things by color and, and illustrate. Um, they need to chunk information, simplify it. Don't use double digits if you don't need to um, when you're testing. Um, uh, students need to master directionality and how to orient themselves and be oriented before they even start doing arithmetic. Um, you need to free up processing capacity with instant access to resources like that uh, place value chart and ways to model numbers and concepts. And you always want uh, experiences to be positive. And, um, you know, you never want to insult anyone uh, on their ability. And if they make mistakes, you don't want to beat them up for it. I make these mistakes when I'm teaching all the time. I may misspeak. I may write my, I may perseverate and write the last thing I was stuck on. And I, I laugh it off and say, oh, I was sticky. Oh, well, you know, that's, that's my brain. And, and I move on. And so you want kids to um, realize, okay, this is my brain. I can deal with it. It's okay. I, I'm not, I'm not uh, incapable. I, I'm just glitchy sometimes. All right. And then, um, so if we can model if we can have resources, if we have a deep understanding, we can do math. 
So I'll leave it at that and take your questions. That was excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, lots of good questions from the attendees. Um, one is um, several parents have asked about the assessment tools to diagnose um, dyscalculia. So um, what would those be and what professional would would be best to carry out the diagnosis? Okay. So I know lots of clinical psychologists who have never been trained to do uh, diagnosis of uh, learning disabilities. Okay. But schools often will say, well, you need to have a, an assessment from a clinical psychologist. And so there's a lot of kind of, um, it's not my domain. It's not my domain. So our neuropsychologist, um, maybe most, uh, but you have to ask, are you trained? Some, uh, some neurologists and neuropsychologists specialize in traumatic brain injury or different areas, Alzheimer's or different things. So you can't just go somewhere thinking that that person can give you a diagnosis. You must do your research ahead of time and ask them, are you experienced and how experienced are you with identifying um, dyslexia or dyscalculia or ASD or whatever it is you, you suspect. Now, in the field, all right, you have to give by law or by standard practice, you have to give a standardized academic achievement test like the Woodcock Johnson or the Kaufman Test of Educational Achievement. You know, there's, there's several of them out there. And then you have to, there's like a definition written into the um, law that is also influencing how this is done. So you give this normal standard academic achievement test and hopefully the diagnostician or the, the examiner knows what they're looking for. If, they, if they're not experienced, if they don't know what they're looking for, what they're going to do is use cutoff scores. If the student did not score below the 10th percentile in math, let's say, or reading comprehension, they'll say, oh, well, they don't have a disability. They're low average, you know, and they won't identify the problem and then it can't be addressed. So you want to, so if you go through your school, which in, in the United States, if you are in a if you are in a public school, um, and even if you are in a private school, you ha you still have the right to testing through your local intermediate school district where you pay property taxes. Okay, um, you can write to the director of special ed and request that your child be evaluated for learning disabilities. Now, they can't just evaluate for one thing; they have to do a comprehensive examination. So on, on dyscalculia.org, there's what we call a learning disability checklist. What I suggest is go through that checklist, print out the results, take that to your doctor, your neuropsychologist, or your uh, uh, psychologist, or your uh, school psychologist, whoever is going to do the testing, and, and say, I would like every area of concern indicated on this checklist investigated and discussed in the report. And that way you can be assured of a thorough investigation of every area because there's usually not just one thing going on. There's a lot of things going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. If a child well, is no one test, there are, there are a lot of screeners out there and they're on my website too. Uh, you can find screeners. If there's a search bar, just type in screeners and you'll get a list of them. Um, there are better tests, um, but um, in a nutshell, you have to use a standard academic achievement test that tests all areas, all, all academic areas in the same mm -hmm. uh, testing window. Okay. If uh, a child is assessed to have dyscalculia, um, can how can it be accommodated for in an IEP or is this a special services uh, requirement where extra services beyond the IEP need to be included? All right, let's talk about that. So just like with dyslexia, 
your school is on the hook for educating this child, whether they have dyslexia or dyscalculia or ADD, no matter what the problem is, it's their responsibility to figure out how to educate them. It's not acceptable to say, oh, they have dyscalculia, so therefore they'll never learn their multiplication table, they'll never be able to do algebra, so we're just going to put them in uh, the resource room and we will have someone help them do their worksheets in there. That is not acceptable. Um, you need one-on-one -on -one intervention, not just intervention, but actually uh, instruction using certain techniques and strategies where you are teaching the child strategies to overcome those errors that I just showed you examples of, because that's their reality. Now, imagine... They can learn, but if you're constantly being frustrated by forgetting to do the right operation, you're adding when you should subtract, you're inserting extra numbers, you're mixing up numbers, you're not going in the right order, all these different things are happening to you, you feel victimized by this disability, and you are frustrated and angry, and you just don't want to do math, okay, which was totally logical. So the child needs to be taught, okay, this is your brain. We tested you. These are all the little glitches that you have. These are the strategies you can use to avoid these glitches or to mitigate them. They need to be taught that. So it's part therapy. They need to know, how does my brain work? How can I, you're, you're not going to be able to like fix it, but you can learn to work with it. It's like being colorblind. It doesn't prevent you from, from living life, but you're going to have to learn to do things a little bit differently. Maybe you write the color of your clothes on the tag so that you match. It, 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 mm -hmm. It's strategies you need to employ to be successful. Mm -hmm. All right, and then tools. So if you can't memorize your multiplication tables consistently and you can't visualize the decimal place value system and you have poor procedural memory, um, then learning procedures in school like we've been learning isn't effective. We need different tools and methods. And that's what you want into the IEP. Someone who knows what they're doing, knows how to educate this type of a student and has the tools and can teach the student how to use them effectively and, and fluently. And that's what you want in the IEP. Mm -hmm. Not more of the same, not, not more of the same slower, <laughs> Assume more simplified, more broken down. No, different. We have to do things differently or we're not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I know this because I am that student and I had all those things, but they didn't work. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> and I basically had to like invent how to teach myself this, which is what all these tools and things are because nobody could reach me. Right. So I had to like invent this myself to solve my own problem because I had to teach this stuff <laughs> first to dyslexics. <laughs> so, so there you have it. Is there um, just one more question on programs and curriculums? Someone is asking, is there a specific program or curriculum curriculum you'd recommend to support students with this calcula? Touch math, making math real, Singapore math. Those are things, suggestions that this person brought up. Okay, so making math real, like anytime you're using um, manipulatives, uh, like uh, Cousinera ads, base 10 blocks, which we do use these things in the classroom. Um, um, uh, um, the balance to do algebra. You always want to, yes, make math real. That's a California uh that's like just for teachers that they train teachers. Um, so anytime you are relating math to real life and you're, you are making models of it, that is the best. Okay. There's this other, it's a really inexpensive program that I like. It's called um, Learning Upgrade and it's, um, it uses music. Some of the kids find it annoying because just the music they find annoying. Um, but you can say, well, do it as an, do it as an analyst, kind of write down your opinion as you're doing it um, and send it to the producer. But I like it because it, it has a, a nice curriculum map. You always know where you're going. It's very colorful. 
and you always know what you've accomplished and what what's ahead of you and what what you just did and it's very modular and it's easy to progress and uh, it kind of makes you feel good to go through it and just mm-hmm. kick it out you know right it's like a video game type of it's not a video game it's not that gamified but it's it's very rewarding and and colorful and i like all the colors <laughs> 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 and it's it's like fifty dollars for six months. I mean, it's not it's not expensive at all. And every school can get a free summer school version of this program where they can sign up as many students as they want over the summer. So if you couldn't afford the fifty dollars, you know, for the six months, you could go to your school and say, "Sign up for this free pilot program for the summer, and then you can enroll my kid in it over the summer, and they can do as much math as they want over the summer." <laughs> You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it has excellent reporting. So uh, that's why I like it. You're talking about making math real, right? Yes. The program. Okay. No, no, no. no the last one I was talking about was called, yeah. um, it was called Math Upgrade, which is, it's at learningupgrade.com. Oh, okay. All right. Now and, I and it's also like on my website under remediation. Mm-hmm. It's also a, a, a listed program. Math, making math real is there also. Okay. There are a, there are actually on the remediation tab of the website. There are a recommended programs. Oh, okay. For this Good. There are a few designed for it. Are dyscalculia and dyslexia related? Can a person have both? And just to add one more question in there, does cal- dyscalculia run in families? Yes. There's a genetic component to dyscalculia, just like there's a genetic component to dyslexia. Mm-hmm. Um, you can read about that on the website too, under the research, if you search research. Um, also, um, you can have dyslexia and dyscalculia. Um, usually, if you have dyslexia, your difficulty in math is related to your dyslexia. You know, like you're um, flipping things around and you're, you know, Mm-hmm. procedural memory, although usually dyslexics have procedural, good procedural memory when it comes to um, motor skills. They're really good at sports usually. They're good at, you know, visualizing. Um, so we're always generalizing, right? Um, trying to find patterns. That's the basis of intelligence um, and learning. Um but not everyone is going to present the same. Not every dys- dyslexic is going to be the same. Not every dyscalculic is going to be the same. So we don't want to overgeneralize, but <laughs> that right. is kind of how we describe things. <laughs> right. And going back to that slide, on uh, several people have asked what causes it. I'm not sure. I don't know if there's a precise uh, explanation. <laughs> Uh, but you were that slide on the brain, I thought was very interesting. Um, did you want to talk about that a little? So, yes. So That's I always what? I always over oversimplify it and say there's this area above your left ear that is like a, <laughs> a math specialty center. And in people who can do math, this area of your brain is lighting up under the FR, F, fMRI machine. This area of the brain is lighting up with electrical activity when when they're doing math. And in people that can't do math, that part of the brain is not lighting up. And the language processor is lighting up. So we know that like the language processor is being recruited to do the, the math uh-huh. specialty uh, uh, work. So, um, and, and I'm overgeneralizing, but yeah. I'm simplifying. But um, so we know that, yes, there and in that area, there's less uh there's less brain material <laughs> you know, by volume there and it's not lining up with electrical activity. And it's, it's so we I can, think this, we can, I think the slide this. is on your screen now. If yeah. You I mean, I can read this to you. Um, okay. It's called the bilateral interper, interpersonal sulcus, uh, the IPS, they call IPS. It's activated when you're doing numerical tasks, like comparing numbers or calculating and it handles the abstract representation of number or magnitude. Um, there's less gray matter in that area of teens um, with dyscalculia who are born with low birth rate. And I was, in fact, a preemie. I weighed four pounds. So maybe that's where it came from. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, whoops. What happened? Okay. Uh, I lost the yeah, the slides are just moving on. I think... Um... 
Okay, we're probably if you want to wrap that up on that one. Um, I have another question is, uh, and I think you've already answered that, can someone with a high IQ still have dyscalculia? Usually people with dyscalculia have a very high IQ. Uh-huh. But to, you know, diagnose a learning disability, you need at least an average IQ. Like, like otherwise they're going to say, oh, the reason why you can't do math is because you're not smart enough to do math cognitively. You don't have the resources. You know, so if your if your IQ is is you know eighty five or above, mm-hmm. um, they say you have enough you know basic intelligence to learn math or to mm-hmm. learn anything else academically. Mm-hmm. So that would be considered you know low average to average. Right. It, it, average is hundred. Fifteen points above or below hundred mm-hmm. is like you. So. Um, so most people with dyscalculia, like the, the pure dyscalculia, they might be early readers, early speakers. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have this lopsided development in math where they just, it, so usually if it's like a pure form, it doesn't make any sense. How can this kid, can't do multiplication? Why aren't they getting this? They're so intelligent in other areas. Mm-hmm. And the same thing with dyslexic kids, you wonder, why isn't this kid reading? I mean, look at the things they build out of Legos and look at the, right, look right. At all the, you can identify all the dinosaurs and the fossils. Like, how come they can't read? You mm-hmm. know, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. No. Does, um, does two, two quick questions. I know we don't have much time. Is there a certain, at what age, is it ever too early to diagnose dyscalculia? I mean, it- okay. So if you have a three-year-old, let's say, who, um, can't seem to count his fingers. I mean, you wouldn't necessarily diagnose dyscalculia there, but mm-hmm. you would say, oh, this is a problem. You know, I need to really work on this. And if you keep working on this at three, four, five, and here the kid is in kindergarten and you've been doing this for, you know, four years now, and the kid still is not counting even mm-hmm. his fingers, there's a problem. Mm-hmm. you know with number if they've acquired language skills but this counting the basics of math are not there yes you can say there's a problem mm-hmm. and 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 try to you know intervene and most i mean all schools uh districts are supposed they have a child find program they're supposed to be finding and addressing these types of problems in young children mm-hmm. so that they don't end up you know in kindergarten and they can't count first grade they still can't count right. so, so if, if you notice that you're not a young child uh, contact your school district's uh child find program you know the special education department of your mm-hmm. intermediate school district right one last question. There are a lot of uh, a lot of uh, parents who say that teachers don't understand it. Teachers will understand dyslexia, but not this. Is there a good article or whatever, a, a, a stat sheet or something that could possibly that a, that a parent can bring to school so teachers have a little better idea? Uh, yes, I mean you can you can send them to dyscalculia.org mm-hmm. and have them. Uh, Look around the website. There, it's full of free resources for teachers and parents. And um, it's e- e- parents need to say to teachers, you know, this is your business. You are in the business of educating, and it's not acceptable to say, "I've never heard of dyscalculia. I don't know what to do about it." Mm-hmm. Well, there's Google. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not acceptable to say something like that when that's your job. To educate every child, not just the 80% that Mm -hmm. can pretty much, you know, not just the ones that could teach themselves, (laughs) you know, every child. Yes. So I I think the hour is up. Thanks so much for being here, Renee, and sharing your expertise. It really was excellent. I learned so much. And, uh, And I want to thank all of the attendees for joining us. And make sure you don't miss future Attitude webinars, ADHD expert articles, or important research updates. 
by signing up to receive our free email newsletters at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. Thanks everyone for being here and have a great day. For more Attitude podcasts and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.